when we are happy, when we are full of sadness, God welcomes us with love. When we are bewildered, when we are full of questions, God welcomes us with love. When we are joyful, when we are full of wonder, God welcomes us with love. Strong and mysterious, bright and holy, God is on the side of love. Wise and questioning, just and joyful, God is on the side of truth. Wild and challenging, glorious and graceful, God is on the side of hope. Welcome to our online worship this week, in the name of our Lord Jesus. As the season of Lent moves on, we begin to glimpse the destination of Jesus' final journey to the cross. Today, as during the rest of Lent, our service began with an image of a cross, alongside which there were some words to hear. And through both words and image, I hope that you will have found a way to encounter God. Thanks to my colleague Sally Coleman, a colleague in Sheffield, who was allowed to share the powerful image which she has painted for us. My name is Patrick and I'm a minister in the Methodist Church in Bristol and South Gloucestershire. And as I offer you a welcome from there, no matter where you are, my prayer is that you will encounter God through the story of Jesus as we draw together in worship to him. Before we continue in our opening prayers, thanks to members of the Festival Choir from St Peter's in Pilnink who have recorded our hymn and to my colleague Sarah James, who's provided our written devotions this week. Please do take some time to read those as well, using the link below the video. Sarah is a member of South Bristol Methodist Church, but also a pioneer worker at the Faith Space Centre in the city centre of Bristol. And so let us pray together. Holy God, we come from our busy lives. We often forget that you walk with us. As we gather now, help us to be more aware of who you are. Give us the courage to admit when we don't understand, so that we may grow more like you in all we do. We come with openness to revere you, to praise and worship you. Allow our hearts to rejoice with everlasting joy. All-powerful God of past, present and future, keeper of promises, how we love you. Son of man, the way, the truth and the life, loving despite rejection, how we love you. Holy Spirit, living power within, helping, guiding, testing and transforming, how we love you. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, your unique relationship open to us, how we love you. And as we offer our prayer of praise, so we offer our prayers of confession. Words of greeting on the lips. Words of love on the lips. The example you gave to us. Forgive us when we fail to act as you do, Lord. Words of retaliation, insincerity and malice on our lips. Forgive us when we act towards others in this way, Lord. Forgive us for not setting our minds on you and your ways. Fearful of rejection and wary of being our true selves. Forgive us and help us to give of ourselves as you give. Forgive us, Lord, for our failure to trust you, for not allowing you to be in the driving seat. Lord of covenant relationship, Lead us and help us to live your way. Jesus was handed over to be crucified and died, but then rose again to make us right with God. Through him we are forgiven. Let us follow the Lord our God together, giving our lives as he gave his for us. Amen. If you've been listening to these reflections over the past few weeks and indeed months, you'll probably realise that I'm not in one of the normal places that I usually am. 
My wife and I and the little boy that we currently foster are in the children's hospice not too far away from Bristol because he needs some medical treatment at the moment and this is the best place for him to be. By their very nature, hospices are places where death is confronted and handled but there are also places of care and support and in our case at the moment a place of respite and sanctuary. Some of that is relevant to this reading because as Mark explains Jesus foretells his death and his resurrection but as he does Peter in particular is really upset by that perhaps confronting some of his own fears about the loss of Jesus and about death itself and I think we've got something to learn from this story which we'll be exploring in a few moments but from Mark chapter 8 starting at verse 31 then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again he said all this quite openly Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him but turning and looking at his disciples he rebuked Peter and said get behind me Satan for you are setting your mind not on divine things but on human things he called the crowd with his disciples and said to them if any want to become my followers let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me for those who want to save their life will lose it and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it for what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life indeed what can they give in return for their life those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them the son of man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his father with the holy angels he said all this quite openly if our view of Jesus is a meek and mild-mannered man these words are far from that this is a full and frank no holds barred sort of conversation one beginning with Jesus predicting not only his death but the manner of it in great suffering and Peter taking him aside and responding with words of rebuke ones which I feel are driven by Peter's inner fears Jesus in turn rebuking Peter with those words often remembered get behind me Satan if that were not enough he goes on to expand on how difficult it is to live a life of faith one of self-denial losing our lives following Jesus and taking up our cross for those disciples and the crowd gathered around them the brutal and fear-ridden instrument of death of the Roman Empire the cross was presented right in front of them by Jesus so for me it's no surprise that Peter and the others imagine their own fears and try to deal with them in fact they just bubble over and they're presented to Jesus and this is certainly not as a result a cozy chat between friends but one in which tough questions big issues are unearthed and are left to be tackled not only for that group of early disciples but as we turn to our situation one that I think we can learn something from it might at first glance be something which is hard to hear in light of the sense of weariness which with many of us are living at the moment we know we have to face some of the big questions but perhaps we simply don't have the energy or indeed the inclination and that might even go as far as to bring on a sense of failure leaving to self-doubt even depression and where in this challenging and hard-hitting discussion might we find encouragement and hope if we turn elsewhere in the Bible there are plenty of instances of failure in the well-known stories of the Old Testament we hear of David of Jonah of Jacob 
all of whom in some way, shape or form fail to live up to what God asks of them. But God continues to seek them out and they continue to work with God. Elsewhere in the New Testament, the well-known story of Thomas reminds us that doubt and faith are closely connected. Even when faith is flimsy and hard to hold, there is something to be gained from a good question. And building on the account of Jesus in the wilderness, one of our focus in Lent, Jesus wrestling with his thoughts and emotions. Something tells us in that that faith is not about certainty. Otherwise, in one sense, it wouldn't be called faith. It's about wrestling with ideas, continually aiming for greater understanding and a deeper connection and relationship with God, with one another and with the world. What all of these illustrate is that times of failure, doubt and confusion are almost certain in any journey of faith. Yet from these times we can emerge with fresh enthusiasm because we've really taken our beliefs to task and challenged what's right at their core. Returning to the account from Mark, Peter was taken to task by Jesus, challenged at his core. But I'm sure underneath it all, Peter was doing what he felt was right. As a leader within the group of disciples and others, he reacted to Jesus upsetting the whole group with all this talk of his death. Did he, Peter, want to avoid the uncomfortable truth? Or perhaps just he didn't believe that it would really happen in the way that Jesus portrayed it in suffering. So it's perhaps not surprising that Peter is dealing perhaps with his human reaction because here was the man they valued and cherished. Wouldn't you want him to be around for as long as he can be? Surely you'd not want him to suffer in the way that he was hinting at. And so this conversation between Peter and Jesus challenges comfort and denial head on. It deals with the terrifying prospect of Jesus' death. But Jesus wants the disciples to understand the significance of it, prepare for it and grapple with it, to really understand what it means and in doing so to understand the full extent of what it means to have a faith. And as he does, he challenged the very concept that our life is our own. For our society, that challenge is certainly countercultural. So much about what we hear is about working for our own salvation through what we own, what job we have or had, the holidays and the ways in which we spend our leisure, even the place in which we live. But one thing the pandemic has highlighted is that our life is grounded in community, whether that's in expressions of support in any number of ways, or whether even in the hopeful progress of the implementation of the vaccine, that actually we need nearly everyone to be vaccinated. Before. And so what Jesus is asking and highlighting to Peter is that there needs to be a complete readjustment and challenge of our worldview in society. Something which takes time to work on, arguably a lifetime. In Romans chapter 4, Paul takes a different view on that, but actually highlights that that adjustment and challenge begins right in our faith in Jesus. And actually just taking a step of faith is enough and is wholly sufficient. Because moreover, says Paul, there is enough grace, enough grace ready and waiting for each of us. Ready and waiting because it's the outworking of the ever loving God who constantly wants to connect with us, who constantly wants to form a community in which to allow us to live and be in relationship with God. Jesus rebuked to Peter to put behind him all that denies God needs to be strong, needs to be met head on, because those things which deny God are so strong in themselves. But what Jesus is doing is providing a new focus, a new strong and life-changing focus, the cross. The cross which through Jesus will establish a new covenant between God and humankind, and which 
will be the focus of the community of faith under which around the community of faith can gather and be formed. Were we in a building together now or even gathered in a group outside, I'd invite you for a moment just to look around, see your brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not easy to do that right now. But I invite you to hold in your mind and heart those you consider your friends, your neighbours, whether they're in the church or whether they're not. And just think about them. Because amidst that group there will be days when the weight of the world's problems, their sufferings, their doubts, will overwhelm one or more of that group, even yourself but through the community which surrounds you and which you hold dear, you and I can find support for ourselves, not least when we share the same desire that God in Christ shares with us to connect with each other in this ever-changing, growing faith which we have focused on the cross. For through the cross, just as Jesus loved us, we are called to love one another whether that's through a listening ear, through talking and laughing together, through simply being with one another, or as Peter and Jesus did, to challenge one another and handle our questions, our doubts, and above all, our fears. For those things are the ones we need to be full and frank about, completely honest and transparent about for they are the cross that we carry as we take Christ-like steps each day. But as we pick up those crosses of our own, our faith is sufficient to connect with our ever-present, ever-loving God who has enough grace for each, precious and valuable beyond measure.
as we reflect on those words. Let's pray. God, without sin or blemish, ridiculed and reviled for our sake, transform our barrenness into your fruitfulness, turn our despair into hope and faith, bring water to our parched throats, food to our empty stomachs. God, without sin or blemish, ridiculed and reviled for our sake, in times of war and strife in our world, raise your covenant of peace and love. In places stalked by hunger and famine, rain down your covenant of abundance for people broken and despairing. Whisper your covenant of encouragement. God, without sin or blemish, ridiculed and reviled for our sake, where human pride and earthly glory abound, bring your goodness and mercies. If our vision is blurred and cloyed, may your blessings endure. Where disease and illness have taken root, let your healing suffice. When our faith is fickle, focus our minds on your steadfastness. We pray that the poor shall eat and be satisfied, that the rich will be generous in sharing your gifts. We pray that the mighty rulers of the world shall be humble vessels of your loving justice. We pray that the weak and the vulnerable will find their strength and place in your kingdom. Loving and just God, we pray that your holy covenants will be fulfilled beyond our walls of worship. In the name of the suffering and rejected Christ, your Son, our Saviour. Amen. And we bring these and all our prayers together as we say together. Hallowed be thy name. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Amen. 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 And our prayer of blessing. Let us go out in peace and see the world made anew. Let us go out to meet with a community a family, a society, crying out for some love, looking to encounter the living God. Let us go out to discover God's Spirit is at work throughout our world and be transformed by our encounter with that same Spirit. Let us go by the grace of God. Amen. <laughs>